I just love that watching everybody's lips there and going, saying the answers as we go through the love letter to this very game. That's half the fun of it, I think. Well, good morning, church. How's everyone this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Oh, what an awesome day it is today. <sighs> so for those of you who were able to be here for the movie last night, what did you think of the movie? Was it okay? Oh, it was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. it was a phenomenal movie. It really was. It really spoke to us. So for those of you who are online today, welcome. Uh, let us know in the notes. Say hi to us to know that you're online, and, and uh, we welcome you also here this morning. Um, as we said, we had a great movie last night. Uh, had a lot, spoke to a lot of people, I think. I uh, had some pretty good discussion going on up here about that uh, with some of the people after the movie and, and uh, had some pretty good things to say. So it's always great when they kind of invoke some thought and gets people kind of going and, and uh, psyched up for what the movie is all about. And this week, this week we uh, are going to have our continuation, actually the wrap-up series on our Lenten series, The Seven Words. Um, next week we go into Holy Week, and uh, or I should say the week after that we go into Holy Week. And so uh, we're going to dig deeper again on Wednesday in talking about uh, the final chapter, which is, Into Your Presence I Commend My Spirit, which is Terry's message for today. Now, uh, one of the things about that is, is this is kind of fun because um, it's also, depending upon which gospel you read, and this is one of the big contention points of atheists and everything that they've said for years, is there wasn't a uh, conclusive statement said by the gospel. So Matthew and Mark said that with a loud voice, he gave up his spirit and died. Luke, who is speaking to the Greeks, he says, into your presence I commend my spirit. And then in John, he is speaking to the Jewish community, and he is saying it is finished. So uh, as we go through to the, the message today, we're going to learn a little bit more about those kind of things and, and uh, why there's a difference in what was said in the Gospels. And really, it had to do mostly with the audience they were writing to, they were trying to speak to, because it means different things. So beginning for us then, on March 24th, we begin our Holy Week with Palm Sunday. And then uh, following that up on Friday, we're going to have a Good Friday service at 7 p.m. And then we get to have Easter, and he is risen. So Easter Sunday worship at 10 a.m. We look forward to all those kind of fun things happening there. So a lot of things going on. The Holy Week is always a very busy week for us in there. And then following that up on April 6th, will be our next men's breakfast that we're going to be. So come hungry, get fed in more ways than one. And then following up that, the following week, then we're going to have season 19 continuing on through. April 13th uh, is going to be Orange Track Racing again. So we got a lot of good things coming up in our calendar here. It's always good to have fun things in the calendar to look forward to. Um, for those of you who are online, uh, today's worship, uh, the music will be posted up in the tiny URL that goes up on there, so you just have to click on that, and, and uh, it'll be the uh, worship songs that Terry's cre created for today, and so uh, to follow in with the message. Uh, well, let's go ahead and open today with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather together here in your name, to freely and openly worship you with no, no kind of retribution that we could possibly get. So Lord, we just ask that you would come into our hearts today. Send your Holy Spirit into our presence right now. Fill us today with your word, with your songs, with your message in so many different ways. Because Lord, in you we do take refuge. And Lord, you speak to us and you guide and direct our lives. Uh, if we listen to you, we have to do our part as you do your part. So Father God, we just praise you and thank you for that today, and we ask a special blessing on Pastor Terry as he brings forth the message that you've given him to give to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So today, Pastor Terry has uh, chosen for our call to worship from the Psalms, 
Psalms 31, 1 through 5. And again, this is kind of a, uh, the psalmist in here is writing to uh, a portent of what was to come. And so it's kind of uh, nice to look at this and see the word that God put on their hearts so many years prior, about 700 years for the psalm, uh, to be able to be shared with us and, and shared later on. So Psalm 31, 1 through 5 from the NIV says, And you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me into your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Keep me free from the trap that set that set for me. For you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. So as we think of all the things that Jesus was going through in the days prior, in the weeks prior to the crucifixion on the cross, he was he was encountering all these people who were coming out and coming against him. And, and so he had to feel like he was constantly under attack. And at the same time, uh, you know, he was trying to speak to the people and give them encouragement and give them the blessings that God wanted them to have at the same time. So it was a real dichotomy for him. He was being torn in different directions. But what we hear from this passage was uh, it was a commitment of life to the psalmist who wrote the package that passage in there. But in contrast to that, when we think about that, if we think about it, he, he says, Lord, you know, defend me and, and keep me safe and be my refuge, and in you I'm going to put my trust. So for the psalmist, it was, hey, I'm going to put my life in you. But for Jesus at that point in time on the cross, it was his committal of death at the same time. So we have to understand that, you know, there were two sides to this psalm as it was written. In Luke 23, 46, it says that then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those, he breathed his last. And when Jesus gave that cry from the cross, see, he was closing that book on the old covenant that was made uh, with the Jewish people back in the days of Abraham. And with that, then, at the same time, as he closed the book on one, he opened the new chapter, that new covenant with God. And even beyond that, at the same time, there's much more than that. See, because it changed how God responded to his people. By Jesus' death on the cross, and by him commending his spirit into God's presence, he was showing an example of what the people were to do. And it brought that right relationship. It restored that right relationship with God. The new covenant brought with it salvation and redemption and relationship that the people didn't have before. But what really changed was the redemption. Because here, it is now personal. It's a one-on-one -on -one redemption, rather than nationally, as, as if we think of the redemption when they brought the Jewish people out of Egypt and out of bondage, and he restored them as a nation at that point in time. Now it's personal. God's redemption is individual as well as being, as we say, corporate. Paul gathered up both of those uses in his all-encompassing affirmation. Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord, from Romans 14, 8. So our relationship with Jesus on the cross and his death on the cross, our relation changed from a corporate relationship, the body as a whole, into a personal relationship with God directly without the intervention from any kind of priest. We no longer needed to do the sacrifices to God because that one sacrifice was for all, once and for all. So as we, as we take a look at this, there's a lot more that got spoke from the cross than what those simple words were. And we need to understand that this set the path then for us for all the way into the future for everything that we had to do from here on out. This was our future. This was the new covenant in God. Let us pray. 
Father God, we praise you and thank you for opening the door for us to have that right relationship, that restoration, the relationship renewed with you, that we can have that personal relationship without any kind of strings attached. We just need to have faith in your son and believe that he is the risen Messiah. So Father God, we just ask today that you would open our ears to hear the message that Pastor Terry has for us. Open our hearts to receive that message and give our spirit uh, that extra bolster to have us live out that message day to day in our very daily lives. In your precious name. Sun's not shining quite as bright as it was before. That's a beautiful day out there. Today, as we finish our Lenten series, set of words, it is, and I, I told Mark this just before service. In fact, even at the bottom, because I, I always put something in the footer, like the series name and the title, it still says it is finished, because for all week, that's where my mind was. But they're both part of the message today, because they both tied together. Now, this week's message definitely picks up where last week's kind of tapered off. And, and just as we saw uh, Wednesday night as Mark was giving, uh, talking to us, the messages are so interwoven that it's hard not to talk about one without talking about the other. And so we're kind of right now in between where God, or Jesus says, I am thirsty, and it is finished. So let's listen again to uh, the way John writes this. In John 19, 28 through 30, he says, Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is is finished. Then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now there's some symbolism in here that we need to take note of. The hyssop branch. It was a hyssop branch that the Israelites would paint blood on their doorposts at the first Passover. Here, the hyssop branch is used for the final Sacrifice, whose blood protects all who accept him as Lord and Savior. In both instances, God is judging. And in both instances, God is delivering his people. In the first, he delivered the people because they put the blood over the doorpost, so he passed this, it passed over. And in this final instance, it is Jesus' blood that delivers us. It is finished. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. He was sacrificed to protect all of us from coming judgment. That debt's been paid. In our study, Susan Robb describes a place where heaven touches earth. It is in that moment that Jesus speaks his last words and places himself in the hands of the Father that the heavenly realm touches the earthly realm. She describes these as thin places, and thin places come from Celtic, the Celts. And she'll talk a little bit more about this on Wednesday night when we watch the video. But there are several places in the Bible that we could see thin places, places where heaven and earth touch. The Garden of Eden, God walked. The Tent of Meeting, or the Tabernacle, when the Israelites were uh, in the desert, the burning bush, the temple that Solomon built, and of course the cross. So as I was thinking of those items, I was thinking of where do we meet God? And so what is, you could say, what is your tent of meeting? Where do you go to spend time with the Lord? See, having the Holy Spirit dwell within us 
that can be just about anywhere. In the past, I've mentioned a couple places where I like to go. Every day, it's that cup of coffee sitting on the chair in the dark with my phone reading my morning devotions. Other times, it's walking in nature and just taking in the amazing portrait that God has painted for Sometimes it's here, just setting up for an event by myself. Some, I, just taking that time and just communing with God. But what it boils down to, it's purposely spending time with Him. So my next question to you, and nobody has to answer this out loud, is how do you experience God's presence? Is it reading? Is it praying? Is it serving? Or is it just taking in the wonder of God's creation? The following I shared on Wednesday night, but it fits in here as well. Because this is where someone meets God. There was a video online that was titled, Three Things I No Longer Do in My Walk with Christ. Read the Bible, attend church services, obey my pastors. Uh, video's creator, her handle is uh, Mernice Mia. And she goes on to explain this. Read the Bible. She says, I no longer find it beneficial to read the Bible anymore. Since growing in my faith, I found that studying the Bible is so much more beneficial. At the beginning, I used to try and read chapters as quick as I could without taking anything in just so I could say I've read it. By taking the time to study the Bible... I'm much more able to hear what it is God is saying to me. Number two, attend church services. Yes, I absolutely loved attending church services at the beginning of my faith journey, but it got to the point where I realized I wanted to stop. I started serving at church, and I love being able to be part of the framework that helps build the church. And finally, was obey my pastors. I used to believe that pastors were full of much more wisdom than I was, so obeying them would be like obeying God. Even though pastors are called to ministry, it's important to remember they too are just humans. They should not be viewed more highly than the Word of God. So if you were going to obey your pastor, discern first whether they're saying what they're saying is aligned to God's Word, and if it's not, don't obey. And when I first saw that headline, the three things I no longer do in my walk with Christ, and then I saw those three items. Without any context, it was like, <laughs> But she has found the things that put her in her thin place, where she comes together and meets with God here. Throughout the New Testament, we see Jesus spending a lot of time with the Father, and most notably, he spends it with God in prayer. He prayed in the good times. He prayed in the bad times. And everything in between. Prayer is an intimate conversation between you and God. The title of the message today is Into Your Hands. This is the third prayer that Jesus prays from the cross. The first was when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. The second, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he prays into your hands. This is a prayer that he would most likely have learned as a child, as part of a bedtime prayer. Into your hands is a prayer that comes from the Psalms. And Jesus, in this moment, is placing himself into the hands of the Father, as we should. We should be putting ourselves into God's hands. Back to our call to worship this morning from Psalm 31, 1 and 5. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, 
for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Keep me free from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. Now, if we go back a couple hundred years to Webster's 1828 dictionary, refuge, and this is the second definition that it lists in there, but it says refuge is defined as that which shelters or protects from danger, distress, or calamity, a stronghold which protects by its strength, or a sanctuary which secures safety by its sacredness, any place inaccessible to an enemy in God's presence. When we place ourselves into the hands of God, we are placing ourselves into that refuge. And in this psalm, David is taking refuge in the Lord. And to take refuge in the Lord, we must, as David did, depend on and trust in God. It means turning away from our own ways or the ways of the world to do things and instead turning to God and doing <coughs> the way that God would have us do. When we think of taking refuge in God, it isn't just somewhere that we can physically go. I mean, well, for a lot of you as kids, you know, it was, let's go take refuge during this tornado out in the hallway by the, the lockers and we'll just put the book <laughs> over our head. Yeah. Or maybe crawl under your desk because that nuclear missile's coming. I'm not sure how much refuge there was on that one, but it's not necessarily a place that we go. It's a spiritual place of refuge. And a stronghold like this cannot be taken over by the enemy. It's a place where we can rejoice in the victory over our enemies. And yeah, even in the worst of times, we can rejoice in God's refuge when we place ourselves into his hands. Psalm 5, 11, and 12 says, But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing joyful praises forever. Spread your protection over them, that all who love your name may be filled with joy. For you bless the godly, O Lord. You surround them with your shield of love. This is what happens when People in, in whatever they're going through, and we've talked about my daughter Amanda, she is going through stage five kidney disease. She needs a transplant. She just had another surgery because there's clots in her arm. And then they couldn't get them all, so there's a whole other thing of stuff coming down the line. Yet she is putting herself into God's hands. And I like to think that this is something that she learned from me because when she and her mom took her and, and left the state and I had no idea where she was, I placed her into God's hands because that was the only thing I could do. Every day I place all of my, three of my daughters and their families into God's hands. Every day I place my wife into God's hands. In this particular psalm, it is the first to pray for the downfall of all those who persecute us. And in the closing verses, in these closing verses of this psalm, David is expressing the assurance of God's promise that we as his children have. We can rejoice in that God's shield protects us and keeps us safe. Later in Psalm 16:1, he says, Keep me safe, O God, for I have come to you for refuge. God is there for us. Even when we're not there for him, he's there for us. He is faithful to his promise. It is in that promise that we can find this assurance. And when we make God our strong fortress, we are unconquerable. There is no safer place than being sheltered in the hands of God. And Jesus would do the same on the cross. He would entrust his spirit into the Father's hands. So let's hear how Luke describes this. It says, by this time it was about noon and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, 
I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshipped God and said, Surely this man was innocent. And when all the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw what had happened, they went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance. Three hours. It's as if nature itself was mourning Christ's death on the cross. We can go back, and this shows the interwovenness of the Old and New Testament. Let's go back to Amos 8, 9, and 10, where it says, In that day, says the Sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth while it is still day. I will turn your celebrations into times of mourning and your singing into weeping. You will wear funeral clothes and shave your heads to show your sorrow as if your only son had died. How very bitter that day will be. But the, this happening in Jesus' crucifixion, it's as if the son was hiding its face in a deep expression of sorrow and grief. And throughout this scripture, this type of expression or lament has been represented by darkness. God's divine judgment has also been represented by darkness. Now, there are a lot of people out there that would say, oh, it's just a solar eclipse. God wasn't involved. That didn't happen. Here's the problem with that. Passover occurs during a full moon. When there is a full moon, you can't have an eclipse. It just doesn't work that way. So their own science, which they say trumps religion, proves them wrong. No one except, expected it to go from light to dark as Jesus is being crucified. Then again, if you think back to when, the, uh, when Moses was leading the Israelites out of Egypt, Pharaoh didn't expect it to go dark either. In Exodus 10, 21 and 23, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Lift your hand toward heaven, and the land of Egypt will be covered with darkness so thick you can feel it. So Moses lifted his hand to the sky, and a deep darkness covered the entire land of Egypt for three days. During all that time, the people could not see each other, and no one moved. But... It was light as usual where the people of Israel lived. This plague brought, was brought on by no warning. Pharaoh didn't know it was coming. The people that were at Jesus' crucifixion had no warning that, that darkness was going to happen. And as darkness enveloped them, Luke reveals that the curtain in the temple is torn down the middle. Now the temple has three parts. So it's un important to understand what the curtain was doing in there. So the outer courts are for all the people. And if you're like me, now you're starting to sing Take Me In, which we will sing later, so we'll get it out of your heads right. Second is the holy place. This was only acceptable to the priests, and this is where they ministered. And then there was the holy of holies, or the most holy place. It was the curtain that separated the holy place and the most holy place. And once a year, the high priest would enter into the most holy place to atone for the sins of the people. Here was the Ark of the Covenant, as well as God's presence. The curtain was also known as the paraketh. It guarded the holy of holies, or the most holy place. To the religious leaders, the tearing of the curtain in two had to have been unexplainable. There was just no rhyme or reason why it would have happened. But here's the uh, kind of the ironic part of all this. The people that witnessed the curtain tearing in two are the religious leaders. They're probably preparing for the evening sacrifices. They would have been probably the only ones to see it. 
It's also a little bit ironic that this tearing of the curtain in two, well, it literally would shred their lives and their positions because it, they weren't needed anymore. Everything that they had was going to be taken away from them. Throughout his ministry, Jesus would remove barriers between us and the Father. This tearing of the curtain can truly be seen as the final barrier being torn. With the final barrier removed, Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. It is then that Jesus takes his final breath and the words that John recorded come to life. It is finished. Now I love how the writer of Hebrews puts the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. In 10, 19 and 22 it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter earth's or heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Now, I'm not a gamer, but I thought, I know people who are, and the, the first thing I thought of was, you know, like in a game, after you clear a level, it says, access granted. Can you imagine looking into the temple and you can see where the, uh, the doors are, may be open and you can see where the priests are preparing, but all of a sudden that curtain tears down and you can see into the most holy place. And you can see the Ark of the Covenant, which no one is supposed to see except the high priest once a year. This is not a video game. This is so much more. I mean, I, I was around when Mark, Super Mario Brothers first came out. I can remember the final scene. Somebody else cleared it. I'm not coordinated enough to play video games. But just, you know, you got the screen up and you got Mario coming in and here's Princess Toadstool and it says thank you. <laughs> That's the end of it. This is not the end of it. Our quest is not over. We still have the rest of our lives here on earth, whether that's an hour or years down the road. But it doesn't even stop there because after that we have eternity. The old covenant in this moment has been replaced. Jesus has replaced it. The old religious structures are no longer needed. There's no more need to sacrifice for sin because Jesus has taken that upon himself. He is the final sacrifice. The people gained a new and unfettered access to the Father through Christ Jesus. Through faith, we now have access, full access, to our Heavenly Father. Better access than an all-access pass at a concert. The Roman officer who was overseeing the execution he kind of puts that final exclamation mark on everything. He worshipped God. And remember, he's an atheist Roman, so he worshipped God and said, Surely, this man was innocent. This Roman officer was one who would be over hundreds of them. He has influence beyond just a normal centurion. And he proclaims, surely this man was innocent. I have to believe at that moment in that day, that Roman officer made the decision to place his life into Jesus, or into God's hands. So it's holding you back from placing your life 
Father, it's through the Gospels that we are able to hear the account of your son's ministry, his life and his death on the cross and what that means. And Father, so many want to look at the Gospels and say, they don't line up. They don't match up. They have different words. They, have di they saw different things. They wrote different things. They heard different things. But Father, we have to be reminded, as Mark reminded us earlier, that each writer has a different audience. And what they wrote has the same meaning. What matters, Father, is that your son went to the cross. He bore our sins upon himself. He died. But he was resurrected. And now he sits at your right hand, Father. Father, as we end this series, we thank you for allowing us to go through this and to truly learn more about these seven words and in context what they mean. Father, as we go through the final week of Lent and into Holy Week, Father, we just would pray that people would come into repentance. They would seek out a Christ-centered church that truly speaks the word of the Bible, that teaches the lessons that you have for us. And whether it's here at Grace Street Church or other churches around the city, Father, that are truly Christ-centered and Bible-believing, we pray that every seat would be filled, that the sanctuaries would overflow, Father that people would be hungry to hear your word. And that they would understand that it isn't just finished here on earth, but that we have placed our hands, or ourselves into your hands so that we could take refuge in you, Father. In Jesus' name. As we come into this time of communion this morning, I want you to take remembrance as we're called to do. Communion is an act of remembrance and it's to remember Jesus on the cross. The whole meaning behind it, because there's so much more than just simply a man being nailed to a wooden cross. There is so much more for us to understand. And as Pastor Terry talked about in the message today, there's so much more that went on there, that restoration, the, the finishing of the old covenant. No more sacrifice because Jesus was the sacrifice for all. It's so much more because the veil was torn in two and it tipped down the separation between God and his people. Because we had a new high priest that sat at the right hand of God. And it was Jesus. So we now pray to Jesus because he is our high priest. He is the link, the thin place between God and earth. He came and walked among us. His entire ministry was a thin place between heaven and earth. He was heaven on earth for us. <laughs> and so by doing this and by dying on the cross he paved the way for us to have that relationship and to have that promise that when we come to our time when our time is finished that we can enter into that relationship that eternal relationship with God so it is more than just simply an act of a person going to the cross it paved an entire way for everyone to come into that relationship with God and to be able to join him in heaven forever. Amen.
on the night that he was betrayed, as they were having their Seder meal, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take. Later on in the meal, he took a cup and after he filled it, he blessed it and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink. It is our capability then to share in that same blessing as we partake in communion together, in communion with each other, as we remember that sacrifice, remember the covenant that we now have, remember that our separation with God is at hand. Our sins are washed clean. We're no longer in a death sentence, but we have new life through Christ because of his death on the cross. The body of Christ broken for you. Take it. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. And as always, for the people today and um, I just want to add a person Sherry Hulkey is my daughter's fiance's mother and she's having neck surgery Friday mm -hmm. I'm having neck surgery Wednesday so I'm going to add her to my prayers this morning hers is more of an emergency thing so we'll just pray that God help her through all this mm -hmm. is there any others that would like to ask for prayer this morning I'd like prayers for the family of David Popelka because he did pass this week. We prayed for him Wednesday night, but he did pass. Okay. Okay. Anybody uh, else? Right. Debbie Wright, her mother passed away. Um, Debbie's daughter, Elizabeth, is, um, and her husband are friends of ours. Oh, okay. Okay. Let's get started. Father God, just bring the Holy Spirit in here and help me to pray. Father God, we come to you this morning to glorify your name above all names. You are our shelter and hiding place in times of trouble. As Psalms 91, 1 and 2 state, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I trust. We exalt your name above all names, and we trust you with our lives today and always. Father, we lift up the people who lost everything from the tornadoes in Ohio. We lift up the families of loved ones that lost their lives in this tornado. We pray the people will come together to help one another. We pray they comfort each other through this time of restoration and sorrow. We pray that out of the darkness they will find that you are with them and guiding them through from day to day. That you will bring beauty from the ashes. Help those that are lost to find you in the midst of all they do. Help them to turn to you and praise you in the darkest times. That you will shine light into their lives. Father God, we lift up David Propelka's family and we lift up Debbie Ray's family who lost their mother this week. Father, we just praise you for their lives. And we thank you for all they have done for you and all you have done for them. And we just, um, we just ask for comfort and peace to be with all of these family members that have lost their loved ones this week. Just comfort them and give them the peace that passes all understanding like only you can, Father God. Father, we lift up Amanda as she is struggling through her trials in this life with this uh, kidney disease. We just ask for grace and mercy for her, Lord Jesus. We ask that you cover her with the blood of Jesus and lift her up and just guide her through this time, Lord. 
If it is your will, let them find a donor so that she can um, live through this, Lord Jesus. And let it be your will. And we thank you for that blessing in Jesus' holy name. Father, we lift up Sherry and my grandson Colt, Mark, Joe, Don, and myself for healing. We believe that what you say is true. Your word in Psalms 91, 14, 16 states, Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. Will I satisfy him and show him my salvation? We believe this word. We believe your word, Lord, and we accept it in Jesus' name. I do ask that you be with Sherry and myself and our doctors and nurses in our surgery rooms this Wednesday and Friday, that the Holy Spirit reside in the place with us, that you guide their minds and hands to do and correct what needs to be done to bring us back strong and healthy once again. Do not let them cut or nick our vocal cords or our spinal cords, for we need them to be upright and praise your holy name. And we thank you for this blessing, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Father, we lift up our homeless. We praise you for this beautiful weather we are receiving and for giving shelter, food, and comfort to the, these people. Guide them from day to day and give them jobs to help lift them out of their homeless situations. Father God, I lift up my grandson Dylan as he flies home today. Give him peace of mind to be able to get to the correct gates and to the correct and to the connections he needs to be at Safely. Ride with him and the pilots of this of his plane. Keep the pilots alert at all times. Keep the plane intact. Give the pilots wisdom to get from one destination to the next. I thank you for the time we are able to spend with Dylan this week. As spring break comes to an end, please be with all those traveling. Bring them home safely. In Jesus' holy name. Be with our children and grandchildren. Please watch over them so they make right decisions and find friends that will lead them into a right relationship with you. You are God and there is no other. And we give all thanks, glory, and honor to you. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. As we close this portion of our service, for those of you who are online, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you can join us next week in person. But as we send you out today, I leave you with this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you. Go.